What will your future look like? The job you do today could be different than the jobs of tomorrow. Some see this as a challenge. At UCF, we see opportunity. A chance for you to grow your knowledge and strengthen your skills from anywhere life might take you. With in-demand degree programs and resources for your success, UCF Online can help you prepare for the future and all the possibilities that come with it. From the University of Central Florida's Center for Distributed Learning, I'm Kelvin Thompson. And I am Tom Cavanaugh. And you are listening to TopCast, the teaching online podcast. Hey, Tom. Hey, Kelvin. How's life? Life is good. I got my first usage of this uh, mug that I forgot to use during Christmas time, so I'm using it now. <laughs> hey, keep Christmas alive in your heart all year long. Thank you, and Mr. Dickens. <laughs> and even if, uh, you there, boy, what day is it? Yeah, um, yeah, so even if it means just drinking out of the Christmas mug, why not? That, that, you know, I, I leaned into that 12 days of Christmas thing this past year. <laughs> yeah. Keep it going, keep it going. Keep I'm drinking going. out of a, a Cub Scout day camp travel mug, so I have no... Keep Cub Scouts alive. Keep Cub Scouts alive. I'm all for that, yes. That's right. <laughs> your, 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 your kid's about to graduate college, but keep Cub Scouts alive. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, and it's one that he earned for being a counselor from Cub Scout mm -hmm. camp, I think. Yeah, so, uh, what, mm -hmm. are, what am I drinking in this Cub Scout thermos? So, so speaking of... Um, December holidays and gift giving and all. I got the gift recently of a subscription to one of those coffee of the month type clubs. Clark, uh, it's the gift that keeps on giving all I'm year long. i to up my coffee intake because <laughs> I've got more coffee than I know what to do with. So the, the reason I say that is I don't really know who the roaster is. They don't tell you. They, they, they like broker it and send it to you in this kind of this uh, generic kind of a uh, packaging. But this is one of the first two coffees I received, and it is a single origin Sumatra Mandiling that has been roasted to the level called Full City Plus. Now, we're following up a little bit on the Tim McKean-inspired episode back in 105 with all that talk of roasting levels, but Full City Plus is a label that roasters use uh, to denote the beginning of the dark roast coffees. And some coffee folks claim that the Sumatra Mandeling is particularly suited to dark roasting as this brings out chocolate notes in the beans. So, uh, how is the coffee and could you find a connection to today's topic? Uh, I like the coffee, it's good. Yeah, um, I could see myself drinking this again. Um, and this is my kind of connection, Kevin. I thought it might be. As you know. <laughs> this is the, the no ambiguity, on the nose kind of connection. So I love it. Yeah, so you you punch the word dark a couple of times, as in uh -huh. dark roast. And um, we, we have, as our guest today, Dr. Shauna Dark. So I love it. Yes, I assume that's, if that's not the connection, it should be. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's the connection because, Tom, not too long ago, you did interview Dr. Shauna Dark, and Dr. Dark is currently the Chief Academic Technology Officer, or CATO, and uh, she has the title also of Executive Director of Research, Teaching, and Learning. All of those titles are hers at the University of California, Berkeley. Previously, Dr. Dark was the Associate Vice President for Academic Technology at California State University, Long Beach, and a full professor of geography at California State University, Northridge. So is there anything you want to say about the interview with Dr. Dark before we cut to it? Uh, not much. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, the conversation, as I do every time I get a chance to talk to Shauna. Um, but I did kind of prep her that I wanted to talk specifically about this Cato role that she has. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of just jump right into it. Mm -hmm. So um, don't, be, don't be surprised that there's not a lot of preamble, but, um, but we had done some prep with her beforehand, and, and that is the subject of today's conversation. All right. Through the amazing technology that is podcast time travel, here is your interview, Tom, with Dr. Shauna Dark. So, Shauna, thank you so much for being on TopCast. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward to talking about the position of the Cato, the Chief Academic Technology Officer. 
Yeah, so that is what we want to talk about today. The, the Chief Academic Technology Officer, for those who are not familiar with that acronym, CATO, um, it is uh, becoming more and more common, and um, I hear it talked about more and more. There's been an awful lot of great work done by people like Helen Chu and Bill Hogue and your colleague, Jen Stringer, um, a lot of like papers and, and presentations within Educause, but um, it, it happens to be your title, uh, and I thought you would be an excellent person to sort of talk about it. So maybe a place to start is, can you just sort of define what the role of the Chief Academic Technology Officer yeah, is? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's probably going to vary on different campuses, depending upon how campuses are organized. But um, at Berkeley, um, my position is housed actually under undergraduate education. So I have a direct reporting line to the vice provost for undergraduate education and a dotted line to the wonderful Jen Stringer, who's our CIO at Berkeley. And really my, my from a very high level, my job is to support and um, help the campus be strategic around anything related to instruction and research and technology. So um, our unit houses everything from classroom technology to our digital learning services, which is a team of online or a team of um, instructional designers and media specialists, as well as our research IT um, program, which consists of a team of uh, consultants who help researchers with figuring out what to do with their data, where to house it, you know, how to store it, what to do before and after cradle to grave sort of um, guidance around um, their research and the use of our high performance compute platforms. Um, so that's kind of, that's very, um, there are a bunch of other units that I have oddly. So I also have a DevOps team, which helps to um, connect all of our platforms together, as well as all the instructional tools that we provide on our campus. So um, things like uh, Poll Everywhere and Turnitin and Gradescope and all those kinds of things are also managed and licensed through our unit. And we have service leads for each of those products. Um, I also have Calix radio station and advising um, under my unit. And the last group, which I think is really critical, and maybe we'll have time to talk about, is the Center for Teaching and Learning on our campus, which is sort of the faculty center for professional development around teaching and instruction, and also serves as a pedagogical resource around research and connecting faculty to research associated with teaching and learning. So it's um, a really kind of a comprehensive group where I think normally a lot of these teams would be embedded in different places on a campus, maybe with, IS, with an IT unit uh, under the CIO, maybe some would be in undergraduate education and some in some other type of um, administrative unit supporting student services or something like that. Um, but at Berkeley, we're positioned in such a way that all of these are housed under me. And I um, really help to be a part of the campus conversation about how we use these tools, what direction we need to go in with regard to online education, um, the importance of the different types of services that we provide for both instruction and research as well. Wow. So it really feels like you're, you're breathing through both lungs. You got the kind of the technical <laughs> IT side, but you've also got this very academic, like, you know, the Center for Teaching and Learning kind of side. Uh, how common do you think it is that that this role, this Cato role, maybe at other institutions, uh, is is kind of bifurcated like that? Uh, do they all report up through a CIO, or do you think some report up through academic affairs, like a, a, a provost reporting line, or or do you think it's always sort of dotted line somewhere? Yeah, you know. Tom, I think it really depends on the campus, and I think we probably haven't seen any significant trends emerge around this. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I was at Cal State Long Beach um, prior to this and worked in the CSU system for almost 20 years. And um, in my role at Long Beach, it was the exact same role. So Jen and I had a very similar vision about what a Cato should kind of have oversight of. And my, my top job title was not Cato, it was um, uh, Associate Vice President for Academic Technology. Um, and I reported into the provost and not into um, the CIO. In fact, there I didn't even have a dotted reporting line to the CIO. Um, I think time will tell. I just think we're still early on in the rise of the Cato on, uh, on 
you know, in higher, throughout higher ed um, in different types of campuses. And I think it's really hard to say sort of where the trend will emerge. But I will say I am, I feel very strongly about being an undergraduate education or reporting into the academic side of the house. I think this is really critical for the success of the Cato and for the success of the campus in terms of making decisions that align with kind of that core mission around academics and whether that be instruction or research. I see some similarities between the, the Cato title and, and even function and that of the, the chief online learning officer, the Colo. And you know, we in the past, we've talked to Eric Fredrickson on this podcast about some of his research in looking at colos across the country and trying to identify who they are and what they're called, because they're not consistently called the same thing on every campus. Um, and, and I'm sensing that maybe there's a similar challenge with the role of, of Cato. And in some cases, they actually have responsibility. They might be the same person as the as the colo on, on a particular campus. Um, do you think that there will come a time where the Cato title becomes more consistent across institutions like a CIO? Because I'm not seeing it, honestly, in the online learning world. Everybody's got kind of a different title, but, but maybe this is something different. And, and if not, do you think it's important that, um, that that develop so that it becomes something that's much more understandable from a consistency standpoint? Yeah, I, I do think um, whether or not we actually use that title for Chief Academic Technology Officer or not, um, I do think these positions are beginning to emerge just from my own personal experience, right? And being in a position that was very similar to the one I have now that's twice in a row, which I think is pretty unusual. Although I was both times under leaders who had a lot of um, foresight right, around what was really needed to help propel the campus into a more resilient campus as we look at a future with a lot of disruptions. Um, I, I do think they're critical. I think these positions are really critical for, um, you know, really helping campuses to navigate the new normal um, after post-pandemic in particular. Um, because what we're seeing, our faculty um, are relying more on technology right now than they ever have before. And now they're returning to campus and they've developed a new sense about technology and what that sense will look like, how people are using, faculty are using technology for instruction. It's just, it's not entirely clear yet, but it definitely will be more. And um, because of that, um, I think it's very important that there is a strategic voice that is just focused specifically on technology and instruction and, and pedagogy and the impact of these tools on the way in which students go about learning. I think that is something that is absolutely critical for every campus to be thinking about and building a structure around so that we're not making assumptions about what are the best tools just based on our conversations with vendors, right? We're thinking about what are the best tools based on what our faculty need and what we know have a positive impact on student learning outcomes. How my position sort of interfaces with a chief learning officer, I think is super complicated. Um, at Berkeley, we're going through a process right now where not only has the use of tools increased, but our interactions with third party vendors around the development of online programming. So things, Companies like edX2 slash 2U or Coursera. We have another uh, vendor called Shorelight on our campus. And, and, and all of those vendors have been extremely strategic about approaching our campus about the development of comprehensive online programs, which we've not had in the past at Berkeley. And so our campus leadership has really raised, has a raised awareness about Berkeley's presence in terms of online education and is really thinking a lot and having lots of discussions about what that looks like and what it means. But what's really clear is that my job, my role definitely overlaps in this area, as does um, Suzanne Harrison, who works for me. She's the director of our digital learning services. So she oversees our instructional designers and our media team. And her role is kind of being elevated more strategically too, because there's no way I can do everything I do, right? Understanding the research side and the instruction side and 
delve into kind of the development of these comprehensive online programs and really be strategic. I just don't have the bandwidth for it. So this is the biggest challenge that I think I'm facing right now that our campus is facing is sort of trying to figure out where where does where does that piece around the online education end up landing, right? And how is that represented and who needs to be engaged in discussions about revenue generating programs in a way that makes sense and is responsible and true to the culture of our campus. So it is um, it is just an absolutely fascinating time because of that. And um, I'm not sure what's gonna emerge from that. I don't know what, what the answer is gonna be. Well, I mean, you mentioned the pandemic um, and in, in previous conversations that you and I have had recently, um, you, you made a comment about um, how the pandemic seems to have accelerated some of this uh, adoption of technology um, and maybe has lowered some barriers, some objections that faculty have typically had because they were sort of forced to use things. And now that they maybe aren't as forced to be online, they still want some of the same tools. Um, it seems to me that having somebody in a Cato sort of role becomes even more critical in the context yes. of this accelerated cultural change that we're experiencing as a result of the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely, Tom. And I think, um, you know, it's it, one of the things that, um, for a lot of different reasons, I think that's true, right? I mean, one is trying to figure out how do we support faculty with what their needs are? How do we ensure that our faculty are connecting to this generation of students that grew up with two years remote, right? I mean, this is like that right there is something that's sort of changing the way these students that are coming in have like lived a completely different educational experience than ever before, right? And so having somebody who's there can help connect all of those pieces. And then there's a whole other piece that's starting to emerge that I think a lot about, which is sort of issues associated with accessibility and security of um, the tools that we're using. And I, I know just recently everyone got an announcement from the FBI about concerns related to proctoring software and concerns related to third party integrations and the learning management system and how, you know, we need to be more um, cautious and aware and make sure we have workflows and procedures in place to really think about how we're managing security around all of these tools. And I couldn't agree with that more. And without having a Cato who's sort of organizing that for all of these tools, um, I think it would be hard to be as strategic and right and as secure and as accessible as you might be otherwise. So I do think this role really is becoming increasingly critical for campuses. And I hope, my hope, and I know Jen's hope too, is that all campuses will begin to develop um, the Cato, will begin to add a Cato role to the campus. But, you know, it's, it's higher education is so, um, can be so complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and every campus is organized differently and where power structures are and, you know, those kinds of things make it complicated to just create something like that. Um, it takes time and thought and um, really, I, as I was saying when I um, first started speaking about this, um, leaders with great foresight and bravery to start kind of preparing the campus for a different future. And that's not easy to do. You've really got to have a leader who's willing to embrace that and who kind of has the gut for change, which is just not easy in higher education. Yeah, yeah, it's generational sometimes. Um, it, unless you have a pandemic that changes everything yeah. in, a, in a summer. <laughs> you get pushed off the cliff. <laughs> right, right. Well, uh, maybe in the time we have left, the, the last question, you sort of you know, alluded to the fact that this is something that's needed, that's growing. Leaders with foresight are, are starting to establish these types of positions. If somebody aspired into this sort of role, what do you think that they should do to prepare themselves, to put themselves in the best position to, to get one of these positions as, as they open up? Uh, is there a certain education, training, temperament, uh, background yeah. that, that you would recommend? Yeah, right now it's it's um, because this is an emerging role. It's it's pretty fascinating, and the you know when I talk to other people on other campuses who have similar positions to mine, maybe not um, you know again titled exactly the same thing, but they it, we run the gamut of who we are, and what experiences we have, and um, you know so I come from faculty. I was a tenured faculty member in the CSU system, and like I said, taught for many years and went into administration and and. 
I, I ended up going into this without really thinking about, oh, I want to have a career as a Cato because they didn't exist when I started getting involved in this, right? And so I think right now, you know, the door is open for people with a variety of experiences and background. And I think some advice that I would give is really for if you are interested in becoming a chief academic technology officer, that you really understand faculty, that you really, like if you can teach part-time in an effort to sort of prepare for a leadership role in this field, you know, that would be really good because you're spending time really learning about some of the um, inner kind of cultural systems at play in um, academia that you just are not going to get unless you've had some experience as an academic. So I think that is a really critical thing. You don't have to be a tenured faculty member or anything like that. But I do think having that experience is really critical. Um, I think as these positions evolve, certainly having a background in academic technology will be incredibly helpful. Um, and having some experience in, um, I would say definitely around instructional design would be helpful. But then I also run Research IT, which is our, you know, our high performance compute platforms, which is something I've had to learn a lot about in starting this role. So, you know, you're never going to know everything, right? And there's not a Cato school you can go to. But certainly, I'm um, engaging yourself in that academic culture, spending some time um, really professionally developing through Educause is another great resource. But also, um, you know, maybe thinking about attending um, academic conferences and that kind of thing that um, your campus is willing to sponsor for you to attend that where you're going to learn maybe about advising or something completely different, but um, just really expanding your broad knowledge and making it as broad as possible about um, higher education and how we use technology at large in higher education. Well, that's great advice and, and maybe a great place for us to to kind of wrap up, so um, you know we could we could talk about this a lot more. Maybe maybe we'll revisit this in the future as yeah. as as you um, you know expand your role or or you know uh, grow into different areas and, and have an even bigger impact at Berkeley or, or wherever. Um, maybe we, maybe we can continue this. So yeah, I'd be delighted to come back anytime. I love talking about it. It's so fascinating. But yeah. how lucky we all are! How um, we are all exhausted. But we are all super lucky to be working in this time where we really have an opportunity to shift higher education to a place where it needs to be to support um, our country. So I'm excited yeah. to be here. Well, well, absolutely. I had a friend, a colleague, say when, uh, when the pandemic first started, isn't it, isn't it something to be relevant all of a sudden? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I agree. So, Sean, on behalf of Kelvin, uh, thank you and myself. Thank you so much for being on TopCast. Great. Thank you so much. Well, Tom, that was your interview with Dr. Shauna Dark. Indeed it was, yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed talking to her, and uh, I think that um, it, it, the reason why I'm so interested in this Cato role, I, I just think it's emerging across the kind of higher ed, ed tech landscape, and she's really on the, on the leading edge. And a school like Berkeley that has really embraced this role, even as that title, because we talked a little bit about titles not mm -hmm. all being consistent, mm -hmm. um, I think is, uh, is, is maybe a bellwether of what's to come in other spaces. Mm -hmm. She said, rise of the Cato, which is my favorite <laughs> phrase from the entire interview because it makes me think of like, uh, you know, sci-fi B-movies or something. <laughs> yeah, it's like a Transformers <laughs> movie or something, the rise of the Cato, yeah. <laughs> but I guess, and, then, and that could be like, uh, you know, attack of the Colo. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably what, what most people are afraid of around here. Um, <laughs> I, I am interested, though, in that overlap, and I asked her about that, uh, yeah. between the Cato and the COLO, uh, the Chief Online Learning Officer and the Chief mm -hmm. Academic Technology Officer, because in, in many places they're, they're somewhat embodied in mm -hmm. the same role. It seems like Shauna plays that sort of a kind of dual function right. at Berkeley, yeah. um, and, in, and in other places it's not quite so clean where maybe some stuff sort of lives in academic affairs and other parts mm -hmm. live in, in a CIO, kind of mm -hmm. uh, more IT kind of function, and, and how is that bridged? Uh, I, I think it's interesting how those, those roles are being defined on campuses, mm -hmm. how uh, they're being led, because I think it says a lot about how uh, 
institutions and leadership view these, these functions strategically in how they organize them. And I'm, I just as sort of a student of the space, uh, I just find it really, really fascinating. Yeah, I, I, I think all that's true. I think it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, you know, I can't help but think and say that, of course, institutional context is everything though, right? Um, sure. Like, uh, as you already said, you know, that might lead you to place these individual roles in different parts of the institutional hierarchy than, than you know, some other place. I, I also, um, as an example, thought that online education at a school like Berkeley is likely to be quite different than, say, at an institution like UCF. Like, um, you know, Shauna talked about self-contained online programs and um, OPMs distinct from, like, the teaching and learning mission. Uh, she made those comments about the Center for Teaching and Learning. And here, I think those two things, uh, you know, online education is deeply ingrained. We had some guests from out of state yesterday, and we were talking about online education as it pertains to the the fabric of the teaching and learning mission of the institution, and which is very much where we come from, I think. So it, context yeah. matters. Yeah, it really does. Um, like for example, we have a center for teaching and learning here at UCF, and we partner with them and have a great relationship with them. Um, but they are very separate and distinct from what we do, and, and we're much more sort of in the colo space. And then the some of the other academic technology areas, uh, you know, some of which I think we have some jurisdiction over, but in others we don't. Uh, certainly not research, um, and at the moment, not anymore, uh, classroom technology kind of belongs to the IT function. So we're a bit more decentralized or distributed here than, than maybe Berkeley has it. Mm -hmm. But in other areas, maybe we're, I mean, we, I, we have a bigger online operation than they do, mm -hmm. so it maybe requires a little more focus. Um, I'm speculating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it would probably be a good follow-up conversation with Shauna to kind of better understand that. But it, all of that to underscore your point that context matters. It depends. Mm -hmm. Everybody's a little bit different, and um, there's no one-size-fits-all kind of, you know, structure. Yeah. No, that's interesting. You know, I, I tell you, you know, hearing you say that, it, it, the the theme that comes out of that that probably cuts across those contextual differences is the importance of collaboration. Like whether you're in the same silo or not, like collaboration's the, the word of the day probably. Yeah, I mean, how often is that true, right? Especially in higher ed where you, you may have, um, you know, authority, but not responsibility or responsibility, but not authority, mm -hmm. which is much more common, or maybe responsibility and no resources. <laughs> so you have to partner to get things done. And so I'm, I'm thinking if, if uh, in an area like, um, say, research computing, which Shauna mentioned was an area that she was, she it kind of didn't know a lot about in her background, but, but had to learn a lot about as part of her new role. Um, I imagine you'd have to partner pretty closely with graduate studies and the uh, the mm -hmm. graduate researchers that you would be supporting. And that's probably a finite resource that you have to somehow govern and manage and ensure everybody gets what they need when it comes to something as critical and intensive as, as research computing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know we need to kind of wrap up this uh, postlude after our... Um, uh, interview uh, listening, but I did, just to say this, I appreciated uh, Shauna. She talked about, you asked about kind of preparation for the role, and, you know, she said, well, you know, broad understanding of higher ed, you know, uh, holistically is important, but I love that she emphasized understanding faculty, quote unquote, and shout out here to TopCast episode 99, the importance of faculty valuing and vo voice and valuing in online education. I think that's so important, you know, and it's great to hear somebody in her role say that. Very important. I totally agree. It really resonated with me. I know it's something that you and I both do and try to teach uh, on occasion, maybe not as often <laughs> as we would like, but, uh, you know, at least often enough that we stay mm -hmm. fresh. Yeah. Because I find, you know, things in the LMS have changed, some yeah. pr processes have changed, and yeah. it just, it, keeps me so much more grounded 
in right. the work that we do to actually right. do it um, and That's feel right. what faculty feel when they're teaching a class. That's right. uh, so I, I totally agree with that. Um, I, I didn't think to grab the episode number, I should have, but another one to, um, to uh, maybe go back and listen to if you haven't, that's kind of a corollary to this, is the one where we interviewed Eric Fredrickson about the uh, titles of chief online learning officers across the country. Uh, it's a similar sort of phenomenon mm -hmm. to the Cato, where there's maybe not one defined title at every institution, even if the, the role exists. And it, it's an interesting analog to, to what's happening in the Cato space as well. Yeah, as always, we'll put that in the show notes. I mean, hey, if we mention it here, it's a good chance that it's in the, the show notes. And I'm gonna, you check me, I'm, I'm gonna guess that is <laughs> Finding Fredrickson's list, I'm going to guess that is uh, episode 36. I okay. think I looked at it not long ago, so I think that's right, but hey, it could be something else. But it'll be in the I, show notes. I would not counter or argue with Rain Man here. Uh, <laughs> definitely, definitely 36. Yeah. <laughs> definitely Wapner. Definitely Wapner. Definitely Wapner, yeah. All right, mm -hmm. so maybe this is a good, a good place to try to wrap things up. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, today's higher education, as we've kind of alluded to, can be very, very complex. And mm -hmm. key leaders, such as the chief academic technology, technology officer, can uh, help bring a lot of clarity so that faculty can be more effective in their roles and students can be more likely to learn and succeed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that having that kind of a role puts an institutional um, uh, strategic emphasis on that kind of an effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally, totally agree. Totally agree. Um, Producer Tim says, I, I'm pretty sure that, uh, yep, 36. Ha <laughs> uh, ha. I feel, Thanks, I feel, Tim. Wow. feel very Dustin Hoffmanish now. Yeah, definitely 36. Definitely, definitely 36. Uh, I, I know we're pushing time, but do you mind if I slide in a plug before we get out of here? Slide. Uh, so it's been a while since we have said this, but Dear listeners, wherever you access TopCast, there is more than likely a rate and review option. So we sure would appreciate it if you would look in your app or website or whatever and give this podcast a favorable rating. Our analytics tell us that most folks find us on Apple Podcasts, so hey, if you're there, all the better. But while you're at it, would you please consider leaving behind, you know, just like a, a sentence or two regarding what you like about TopCast? This all helps new listeners discover TopCast. And thank you in advance. Thank you in advance. Yeah. And if you happen to be listening to this on the web, um, it is available through pretty much all podcast platforms, Spotify, mm -hmm. Stitcher, Apple, you name it. Uh, That's right. <laughs> TopCast is ubiquitous. <laughs> or, as, or, as, or as close as we can get to We're ubiquity. <laughs> yeah. We're working on it. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Tom, for a good interview. Thank you, Dr. Shauna Dark. And uh, thank you, Tim, for keeping us honest with fact checking um, you know, our history here of, of our TopCast inventory. And uh, until next time for TopCast, I'm Kelvin. And I'm Tom. See ya.